Um, our panel today is about moving UX upstream to strategy, and it's going to have a research focus, but I think it's going to um, be in general uh, helpful for user experience professionals. Um, a lot of people in our community uh, talk to me about, you know, how can I move from being more focused on execution, incremental improvements, um, kind of the two-week cycle of, uh, of just backlog development, and they would like to have more of an impact on strategy, both the strategy of their um, products that they're working on, services uh, on their teams, uh, in their companies, and how do you get that kind of influence that gives you basically a seat at the table to help establish the direction uh, of your products and companies. And that's what today's panel is going to be about. Um, before I ask our panelists to introduce themselves, let me just tell you a little bit about how the panel works. Um, the first portion will be our 60-minute slot. I have some structured questions. Um, I'm going to ask each question. Each panelist will have an opportunity to answer. Since there are two panelists today, um, it's going to be kind of easy and we'll be flexible with that approach. Um, after the session is over and the structured questions are over, uh, anybody who wants to stay with us and discuss the panel will be welcome to do so. And I'll ask Ben, Judy, uh, UX Strat statesman, um, to start us off with comments after the panel. Um, I would like you to encourage you to tune into the general channel in the Slack community, um, both during and after the panel for discussions with your fellow attendees. Um, one thing I want to note is both of our presenters today are from Google but the opinions that they express today are their own. They don't uh, speak for the company on these kinds of matters, but they speak for themselves. Um, with that, let me ask the panelists to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about your career path. And I'll start with Jennifer. Jennifer, can you kick us off? Yeah, good afternoon and good morning, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Jennifer Otatigbe and I'm a UX research manager at Google. And uh, I've been around UX for many, many years. And I've had many different roles uh, that uh, they weren't necessarily called UX, but all fundamentally the same leaning, which is that in interesting intersection between people, technology, and design. And, and just for clarification, you just wanted a brief introduction, or do you want us to talk a little bit more about our background? I think a little bit about your background, um, how you got to where you are today, some of your story. Great, great. Yeah, so I definitely think about my uh, career path, not so much as a path, but more like a journey or an exploration. So I grew up in a West African family. You were presented with several options for careers, not a lot, you know, doctor, lawyer, engineer. So I chose the engineer path. <laughs> mostly because I saw that as the opportunity to create things. And I got into engineering school and yes, it's true, you could create things, but it wasn't necessarily the kinds of things I wanted to create. And I just happened to get this really interesting experience my first year of taking a seminar called Art, Technology and Society. And that sealed it. That was exactly what I wanted to do with my life. It was taught by an anthropologist, a multimedia designer and a software engineer, all women. And it just blew my mind. And so I pretty much from that began my path to finding out how, no matter where I was, how I can stay this very fascinating in, uh, intersection of people, technology, and design. And that's taken me from technology marketing to user experience as a generalist. So I worked in design and research. Um, I moved up the ranks and, and directed a design team for an NGO, and then also moved more into the specialist ranks of your user research and then back to management. So I've gone you know, back and forth between management and practice uh, and I've seen all angles from design to research to generalist. Very good, thank you so much. Rebecca, can you introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Rebecca. Um, it's great to meet all of you. And Jennifer, I love how you zoomed out and, and talked about, you know, your family and the sort of surprise of discovery of design as a discipline. I had a similar uh, discovery. Um, so I'm from New York originally, I've always loved people, fascinated by how people interact, their quirks, their weird behaviors. Uh, and in undergrad, I did you know sociology and assumed that, that would, I would be able to kind of act on that knowledge. Didn't know UX was a discipline um, and it probably was 
not yet codified in, in UX terms when I was an undergrad. And then studied urban design in graduate school because I knew I loved thinking about how people interact with experiences and was fascinated by how people interact at different scales with the physical environment, the digital environment. Um, uh, and then spent about a decade in a, a very different world of urban, urban development, working mostly in Latin America and the Middle East, and didn't discover what we call tech officially or UX um, until about a decade in, in that more international development scaled world. Um, and then the, the discovery that you could think about design, not just at, a, at the scale of a public space, but at the scale of a computer screen, a mobile phone, and more broadly, how people interact and how that digital experience can inform how they interact with the physical environment was, was this real revelation. I was at Frog Design in the strategy group. Um, and then uh, after that, led the research team at Lyft, um, where we were looking at growth research from a very tactical perspective, but also thinking about longer term bets and how we might want to invest there. And now I'm at Google with Jennifer. This is the first time that we've gotten to meet virtually, but in the same broader mothership. Um, and at Google, I'm in a horizontal, what's called UX strategy role. So we're thinking about how we can push the discipline. Um, what does it mean to think about UX as a strategic force within an organization? And how do you make that real from a process, people and product perspective? Outstanding. Well, I am going to take away this lovely boulder mountain view because I am obviously blocked out at the screen. Um, I would love to see some more of the folks who are joining the call. There's quite a few people on the call and I would love to see you if you dare to turn off, turn on your cameras. Um, all right, well, let's get started with the panel itself. Um, <clears throat> The traditional product design model is the double diamond, uh, with the left diamond being discover and define, and the right diamond being develop and deliver. Um, this model was introduced a long time ago, and the processes have become a lot more iterative since then. They were quite waterfall before. Um, I'm wondering if both of you can share with us how you view the product design process at a high level, especially talking about strategy uh, versus execution in general terms. And this time, um, let me start with Rebecca. Yeah, I love this question, Paul, because I'm a very visual person. I like to have a framework for everything and then push on it and play with it. Um, and so when I think about this, I like to think about three different lenses. There is that traditional double diamond lens. Um, and I share that in my classes and teaching at uh, California College of the Arts. And then there's also the product development process that you can see detailed, you know, when you go into a a sprint or when you talk about agile in a product team. And then finally, I like to think about the lean startup process. Um, and for anyone that is excited about lean startup already, amazing. If you haven't gotten to dip into that, I find it a really helpful sort of third lens for this UX process or product development process. Each one of them has a slightly different visual, but in my mind, they're actually all just saying similar things. Um, and the double diamond captures it as well, right? We need to frame the problem in a way that feels really concrete and compelling, really understand why we're doing this and what problem we're trying to solve. That involves messy research at the beginning. And I really, really try and push for that messy research. And then we iteratively scope down and better understand over time the problem we're trying to solve and how we can solve it. Um, but I really like to bring those three visuals in when I'm working with teams to make sure we have those three different angles. Okay, Jennifer. Yeah, thank you for that, Rebecca. I would say that I still very much believe in a double diamond, but the environment of how we practice has fundamentally changed for two reasons. One of which you already mentioned, um, the idea that iteration and iteration cycles are a lot shorter and also we also have a tremendous amount of new data at our fingertips so the role data science is playing now in understanding customers is introducing new opportunities to impact the product development process with data and insights um, on the first item the double diamond uh, i would say across all of my roles that has been the aspiration 
And then fundamentally across all of my roles, I do believe that we've fallen short. Uh, with time crunches, there are always steps that get skipped. And then there's always uh, this fundamental look back of saying, well, why didn't we spend more time in the discovery phase? Or we really should have tested this before this went out to market, <laughs> uh, things like that. So I would say in, in defense of the double diamond, it's still very valid, but it's very important for us to think about how to operationalize it in the new ways of working. Um, and I'm hesitating to say agile because I have unfriendly things to say about agile. Um, and then on the second item about data, um, I focus now on user research and the opportunities that we have to understand our users better with data and to make fast decisions based on those insights is definitely an interesting opportunity with the double diamond. So I think the challenge moving forward for us as UX practitioners is figuring out how does UX work better with the data centric roles like your business analyst or your product analyst if you have that role. Um, some of you might have that wonderful opportunity of having a quantitative researcher on your team, which I do. Um, and that's a very wonderful resource to have, but I know that not a lot of people have that. So I would say that in summary, that those are the two opportunities. Uh, I believe in the double diamond. I don't like skipping steps, but sometimes you have to based on your timelines. Um, and then figuring out how you could leverage all the tremendous amount of data that we have now better. Well, thanks for that. Um, uh, Jennifer, and by the way, whatever bad things you want to say about Agile, please feel free. Um, when UX started, uh, I started when around the term started. Um, it was really quite left diamondy strategy uh, focus with, of course, a lot of screen designs as well. Um, but with the rise of Agile and product management, um, what, 10, 12 years ago? Uh, the user experience role or the design role has shifted quite a bit uh, toward the tactical side. A lot of times people are put on part teams and uh, their work is chunked in such a way that it's very difficult to have an impact on, you know, the North Star, on the way, the, the path that it's following and where it's going to. Um, in more recent years, it seems like the pendulum is swinging back a little bit, especially at Google. I've been talking with Google speakers since we started UX Strat 10 years ago. And it seems that a lot of the user experience strategy role has moved into uh, the group responsible for research and insights. And they somehow are able to then look at that bigger picture. And so I'm wondering um, from both of our panelists, uh, what's been your experience with respect to product design strategy? Where does it live in your group and how does it work? And again, I'll switch again and ask Jennifer to go first. Yeah, I would. I have to speak across all the different roles I've had. So as I mentioned, I have been both a generalist, so responsible for research and design in an organization that actually did not have product managers. So that was a very interesting experience. It was pretty much UX and engineering that drove everything. Um, and then I've also been in roles where uh, there's a lot more specialization. So there's UX research, UX design, prototyping, you name it, the specialization is there. Um, so I believe that um, the, the challenges that I see with how, uh, how work is kind of being divided is that it's hard to see the big picture and people will optimize for what their role expectations are. And that's, that's kind of the big thing that I've observed with specialization, um, and so with that, it does introduce sometimes limits in to what people can do. So if you're in an organization that's highly specialized and you're a designer, um, you might have to fight that uphill battle of trying to influence the strategy and then being told like, no, we just want you to design this thing. You know, just this piece is yours. Uh, the strategy is up to the PM. Um, and similarly, you know, you could be in an organization with a research team who very much wants to be on the front end um, and maybe not necessarily include design in some of that front end, the, the, you know, they call it the fuzzy front end part of research. And that's also not ideal. I believe that the ideal scenario is you have 
UX, which is both research and design or strategy, if that's, that's the role in your organization, working collaboratively with PM and ENG to explore the opportunities. Um, and that way you're bringing everybody along in the discovery process. And then when it comes time to focus on your role, you all have this shared common understanding of why is it we're doing what we're doing. And something I wanted to comment recently, there's been a, you know, this big, this big push on ops, design ops, research ops, I get it. But the challenges I see is as I've explored those terms and those scenarios, a lot of it uh, links back to, you know, turn of the century, Taylorism, division of tasks to these infinite granular pieces where you kind of lose the big picture view. And I definitely see that as a challenge that all individuals in UX, whether you're on the design side or the research side, need to really work hard against. And I'll, I'll reserve some of my, some of my uh, tactical comments on how to deal with that for the next uh, the next set of questions, but I, I definitely recognize that as a challenge. Okay, Rebecca. Yeah, I'd like to think about this on the individual level. You know, how can I or individual as a UXer move upstream? And then also at an org structure level, where does it, where do you want to position the team so that the team is best poised to be at the table when you're having these more strategic conversations? And at the individual level for myself, I'm always thinking, what is the broader story we're trying to tell? What is the North Star? How we define that? And if not, can I help kind of proactively be one of the voices with my UX counterparts and ideally with my cross-functional um, team really defining that? And so there's, we can talk, as Jennifer said, more tactically about other ways to position yourself as an individual in those strategic conversations. Um, but I think that second piece of where does UX live from an org structure perspective is also really interesting. And there's a lot of different models I've experienced, uh, you know, a variety of them. At Frog, of course, UX is central and I, I got a kind of skewed vision of the centrality UX can play in conversations because we were basically all designers of different flavors. And we were in executive meetings helping define strategy because when you hire a consulting firm, often that's the expectation and there's sort of an immediate uh, pedestal you get to stand on from that position, right? But you don't get to think about the execution. And so I had that vision of the role UX can play and then moving in-house um, was a real wake up call on the ways that you need to push on how UX is defined um, and push back on those assumptions about where you sit in conversations. And uh, when thinking about org structure, I'm a big fan of having UX embedded in product teams and being intentional about either reserving part of your roadmap to take on longer term initiatives or having a team that's dedicated to do that. And I think you can do either one, but you need to carve out the space for that sort of longer term thinking and, and work. Um, and then at, at Google, we certainly have many, many different flavors and models. And there's a combination of the sort of horizontal separate UX insights team and embedded roles that are also pushing on how we define UX and where UX comes in that conversation. And I think the biggest thing is to kind of take stock when you are first in a role and in an organization and say, where are we playing today? Where could we play tomorrow? And do we need a structural shift to help support that? Or is it more about leaning into skills as individuals? Sure. And I do think that the maturity of the organization uh, has a lot to do with what's expected of you if you want to be involved in strategy. Of course, frog design is going to be one way. Um, I think in recent years, Google has gotten a lot um, more people who are designers involved in strategy. And I think it's been a really good thing. Um, I was expecting UX strategy to be a, a role that was um, kind of a progression from, uh, from visual design, et cetera. Uh, but product management was given basically the strategy decision-making power. The problem I have with that is that um, it takes a lot of understanding to create a strategy that I'm not sure that product managers always have the time or the inclination 
or frankly, the skills uh, to get as deep into the matter as they need to, to create the understanding, especially if we're talking about inventing new kinds of products and getting into a new space. I think that this strategy role is kind of up in the air. And I think that we can, we can move toward that. But as you both mentioned, we have to build that credibility, right? It's not normally, unless it's a really mature organization, um, uh, we have to build towards that. And that's kind of what I would like the rest of our panel to, to be about is how do we start building that kind of credibility, uh, especially if the, the organization is not that mature or if the scale of the, the products and services don't really allow much strategy, but just like get to work, get this thing out. We, need, <laughs> we don't have much runway. Um, so the rest of the panel, let's kind of focus on how do you do that moving upstream part? So my next question, uh, and I'll ask this to Rebecca first, um, what kinds of skills and experiences are helpful uh, from your experience for moving from more tactical and incremental uh, work into a more strategic role? What, what kind of people are those and what kind of skills should they have? Yeah, I'll, I'll pick three. Um, and I think there's many, many different ways to do this. I've seen many different flavors, but, um, uh, and I don't think any of these are revelatory. So we probably have all experienced this and thought about it, but I'll share three of my favorites. Um, and the first one's storytelling, which comes up many times in many flavors, but the more that you can hone your storytelling skills, I'll, I'll speak from personal experience, being able to kind of level up what I'm doing, whether it's a research insight or a, a, like low fidelity, you know, proposal for how the experience takes place over a journey, connecting that to the, the higher story and really getting good at articulating that has been incredibly important for me in making sure that my work is seen in the right light um, and contextualized in this sort of broader strategy that I wanna connect to. And that means both understanding the business context, but also bringing in the emotion at the right moments and seeing that as a strength. We don't have to shy away from that. So that's the first one. Um, the second one, uh, I think the empathy that we have as UXers can be really helpful in understanding where your cross-functional partners are coming from. And so the more that I can understand why the PM is freaked out about the metric that he or she needs to hit in three, three weeks or three months, <laughs> um, the more that I can then also frame what I'm trying to do in those terms. Same with the data scientist, same with the designer, like really, really being able to use, see their perspective, but also use their language um, and not hold too fast to my UX research framing, or for example, a double diamond, if I know that's not gonna resonate with my partner, I'm gonna frame it differently in terms of how we're doing this process. Um, and I wanna really understand what's motivating them and be able to connect that to how I'm positioning what we're doing. Uh, so I'll give one quick example, um, sort of abstract it, trying to think about how to improve a rider experience lift. We wanna think about, there's a few very specific metrics. And as we, we did a huge project looking at the user journey, but as we did that, we very concretely identified a few ways that improving parts of this user journey would tie back to the metrics we already had, as we also identified longer term things we could do. So very tactical. And then the, the third one, so storytelling number one, number two is sort of empathizing with cross-functionals and taking on their language and lenses. Um, and the third, again, I think very obvious, but uh, when I come into a new team or a new company or a new org, I want to understand as much as I can about what's motivating the strategy today from a broader lens. And I'm going to ask those questions. What's driving growth today? What are the biggest challenges to it or impeding that growth? What are our metrics today? They might be terrible. We might want to shift them, right? But I really, really, really want to understand that picture. And I think when we give that up to the PM, we lose a lot of our ability to help shape it. So we should be coming in and trying to understand that business context as well. All right, very good. Jennifer. Yeah, very good points there. Um, I want to piggyback on Rebecca's comments around uh, communication and storytelling. Um, and also the great framing that you had around 
what you can do in terms of an organization and then what you can do individually. Um, in terms of the organization, I, I have to say, I've never been in a perfectly mature UX organization ever. I don't even know what that really could look like, but I know what the ideal is. Um, so the advice I would definitely give people is, you know, once you understand what the, the potential good model is, for me, it's a, the triumvirate, the, the collaboration between PM, UX, engineering, since I work in more technical and very, um, usually enterprise domains. So to the degree that you could model the way, try to operate in the way that demonstrates what it's like to have this truly equal footing, truly collaborative environment, you might influence folks to adopting that. It won't be perfect. You might start <laughs> riding on people's nerves a little bit, but what that means is exactly some of the things Rebecca talked about do understand a business strategy, even if you didn't have a seat at the table to make some of those decisions. Understand why things are the way they are. Um, and then think about ways that you could help improve the decisions. Uh, I saw a question that when you see PM, I'm talking about product manager in this case, if that's what the question is. And so that in terms of organizationally, it might idea is there, model the way, be that collaborative partner that you want to see, even if you're not necessarily getting your seat at the table. Try, try to put your foot in there in a way that's going to help your stakeholders uh, achieve better outcomes. And then in terms of individually, I think about two things fundamentally. One is curiosity. Even if you're in a very tactical environment or role, find ways to be curious about your domain. And that curiosity is going to drive you to be very observant, to anticipate where else could this go? And then also to be able to ladder up. Maybe you found a couple of interesting tactical insights that could be explored and that might take your product or a feature in another direction and people aren't paying attention to it. Maybe you could own that and explore it and amplify it and ladder it up. Uh, so that, that's one idea. And then the second one is, of course, communication. And that involves two things. One is really understand your stakeholders and what makes their eyes light up. For everybody, it's something different. And it's a lot of work. But my experience is communication is not one size fits all. For each stakeholder, you need to figure out what makes their eyes light up. And then how can you tailor your message or your findings or your recommendations in a way that's going to hit that sweet spot for them? And then lastly is storytelling. Um, this one was really hard for me coming from an engineering background. I'm very used to like, this is the data, here's the spreadsheet, here's the insights, you know, <laughs> take it or leave it. Um, but definitely, especially coming to Google, I've had to really refocus my um, understanding and skills around storytelling because really it's a, it's a skill that helps drive action on your ideas. It's funny, both mentioned storytelling. Uh, it's been coming up a lot lately uh, for me. Um, my son studies finance at UChicago and one of his core classes is storytelling. I was like, really? Mm -hmm. like, like, okay, that's interesting. And I was talking to a data scientist at Spotify about how can we broaden UX Strat's focus so that we include these other roles, product management, data science. And she said, um, telling stories with data. That's what we really need to learn about because we understand the data, we understand the parameters and statistics, but what we don't get is how to convince everybody else that we know what we're talking about. So we have to be able to tell stories with data. And so that is just coming up uh, a lot of times. Um, all right, let's move forward to the next question. And we're doing really well on time. So feel free to explore these uh, topics as you discuss them. Um, and then we'll, uh, when we get done with the structured part, I'll see if there are anybody having questions uh, that are attending, and then we'll get to those questions. You just have to raise your hand in the, in the section there for Q&A. Um, it seems that the context and maturity of a product design group also has a significant impact on whether researchers and designers can participate in strategy or not. So I'm wondering what some practical ways are that they can help their leadership uh, and organizations understand that 
design and research are more than usability and visual design, um, but they also can impact not only the direction of the next release, but the product itself and even the company itself and even have an impact on business strategy. Um, and that's, you know, that's a, that's maybe a long battle, uh, but I think it's really worth it if that's what you're really interested in. So I'm wondering what can people who are listening do to help their organizations and their leadership get that point of view that they can contrib contribute to those things? And let me start uh, with Jennifer on this one. Uh, I touched on some of these a little bit in the last um, area, but I'll, I'll deep dive on the understanding your stakeholders and the communication with stakeholders. Um, one of the very interesting things I've come to realize is, especially the higher up you go in an organization, the less time you have to uh, really understand, you know, infinite detail, which you might have exposure to as a UX practitioner. So to the degree that you could understand what senior stakeholders care about and help connect the dots to them, you are going to be an asset. Also connected to that is never assume people understand what UX is, whether UX design or UX research. Almost in every large organization I've been, I haven't had this issue in smaller organizations, but almost every large organization that comes this really awkward time when you're speaking to a stakeholder that you thought you've worked with for a long time and you get something like, oh, what is qualitative research? And that's your role. <laughs> or, um, you know, not really fully understanding uh, what is, what UX design can do. You know, thinking maybe UX design is just tactical, just make it pretty. Um, or not understanding that, you know, user research can help your PM with discovery, uh, things like that. So there's this level of almost having to make your pitch deck of what is UX and never assume your stakeholders understand your role. Always educate, even for those individuals who have been around a long time. And how I like to operationalize that is I actually have a what is UX deck that I socialize with stakeholders once a year in one-on-ones. Um, and then also I have one pages of projects that have com been completed where I'm very explicit about the impact. And you might think of this as, you know, why are you doing this? It, it, they should already know this, but as I mentioned, the higher up you go, the more details you have to struggle with. And uh, it's important to synthesize information for people so that they can understand your role and your impact. All right, very good. Um, Rebecca. Yeah, I think I'll build on that um, in giving a few really concrete tips, things that have been helpful for me. Um, and these are things that you may already be doing or may already be happening in your organization, in which case, amazing. Some of these have been sort of hard fought battles or lessons learned over time. Um, very little tactical things. One is as if we're sharing research, I always, always think we should be saying not just the insight, but the recommendation so that we are positioned as a, a POV, right? A point of view and not just the mouthpiece for what we're hearing in the world or noticing in the world. That's number one. And that very concretely and tactically often just becomes an executive summary slide at the beginning of any research deck or two pager. That's here's what we learned. Here's the recommendation or product implications or organizational implications of that. Uh, the second is, um, you know, as Jennifer was saying, often these teams and leadership and PMs in particular, uh, product managers don't have time necessarily to look up and look out. And so if we, as we're doing research, can help bring in the perspective, not just of the user, but of what's happening in the broader landscape, I've seen that be really effective in broadening the conversation and in broadening how we're viewed as UX, because we're bringing in examples of what's happening in the market. We're bringing examples of what's happening, not just in our industry, but beyond what I call analogous inspiration. 
And it can really shift how people think. We're talking about, this is a hypothetical example, fintech, let's look at what's happening, happening in the healthcare space or what's happening in education and bring in inspiration of what's working there that might apply to the particular problem we're thinking about. Um, so I think when we do that, I've seen people really pause and uh, see the problem and our role in a different way. The, the third one is, um, and this one, you may have to build relationships up over time in order to do, but workshops and helping leadership or even the cross-functional team you're working with pause at key moments and annual planning can be a great time for this. Um, but if we can be that voice that's help, helping facilitate not only how we wanna tackle the bugs in our product in the next two months, but also what do we want to look ahead to? And sometimes biz ops or product ops might own this function, but I've done a few workshops where we partner with those sort of strategic capabilities and having UX in the room to say, let's bring people together. We're great at facilitating, right? Bringing those skills to the table and using them in a kind of pause, zoom out workshop moment can be really key. Um, uh, and then the fourth is what Jennifer already mentioned, capturing impact. So at the end of the year, I always do the same thing. Like, what have we done this year? Um, and it's maybe one slide per project. It could be one bullet point per project and an email, but that pause moment on the other side uh, is really key as well. Cool. Well, let me throw in a couple of things there. And then I have another question and then I'm gonna open things up. I see a couple of hands that are coming up. That's outstanding. Uh, and we'll get to those in a few minutes. Um, when I did my first UX strategy project, one thing that we did that worked really well was we started posting some of our sausage making diagrams, et cetera, on the way to the cafeteria where you walked by, you would just see like these posters that um, had our understanding of our customers and of the journey and things like that, that were easy to interpret very quick. And they might have been criticized at first, like, no, that's not it. But that made them better because we got that input from, oh, marketing has some secrets about this that we don't know about. So, so it was like posting in very visual places, easy to understand uh, things that um, showed our understanding. Where are we at? What, where are we at in this process? Um, especially for generative type uh, research projects. Another thing that we did, we took the annual reports of uh, these retailers and um, combed through the annual reports and like, this is what fundamentally this business cares about. These are the levers. These are the needles that need to move for them. So what am I doing or what are we doing as a strategy group, as a design group or research group? What are we doing to impact those things? And can we connect the wires back from the business key performance indicators back to design key performance indicators? And it turned out a lot of times, no, we couldn't. It was too esoteric or, or too... Um, too difficult to see the impact. But in other cases, we could create direct uh, KPIs that were easily measured through statistics, analytics, et cetera. So I think connecting the wires between what design and research are doing and what the shareholders or whoever the um, core stakeholders are, what they're caring about um, was, was very beneficial for that. So I'm gonna kind of turn it back to you two guys and see if you have anything else at that level of just like, hey, day to day, activities, anything in there that uh, rings a bell to you, um, Jennifer? I would say definitely your comment about bringing people along, making the process visible resonates a lot. Um, I think for efficiency, sometimes we might think it's better for us to take our assignment or our um, task or whatever we're, we're being in charge of to do let's just do it and then show the final product and you know move on from there and that almost never works out uh, in a sense of getting buy-in getting people to adopt it internalize it uh, digest it act on it um, I very much appreciate bringing people along all the way from the beginning of your design process or research process how, having folks weigh in on your project, how you're planning your project, um, you know, what kinds of outcomes you're hoping to attain out of the design or the research. The more your stakeholders are brought along, 
the more likely they are to both give you good feedback along the way, and then also to adopt your findings or your final design. Um, and then also um, in terms of making your work visible, that actually is very powerful for UX people too, because what that's going to do is they're, it's going to help people understand that uh, this takes time, this takes effort. And it's not a one hour, two hour, you know, uh, task for you to go off and create designs and options or do research. And the more visible you can make the effort, the more value people will place in the role. That's one of the things I've understood and something I'm working on now is just making the process more visible. All right, and Rebecca. I feel like we've touched on so many good different nuggets. I'm trying to make sure I'm naming something we haven't already talked about. Um, I guess the one other one, um, you know, that I think a lot about the X in UX uh, ex experience can mean so many different things, right? And often we um, contain it to the screen that we're designing for. But we are probably the ones that are gonna be most intentional about thinking about experience and the experience that we're creating uh, out of our cross-functional teams that we're embedded in often. Um, which means I like to apply that to other parts of the ways we're working, whether that's a story that I'm telling. When I think about putting a deck together, I'm like, what is the experience I want people to have as I lead them through this story? Is it, are they gonna be excited and curious at the beginning? Am I bringing them on board with data and then surprising them with an emotional moment? And I think about that as an experience I'm designing just the way I would think about uh, a screen that we're designing as a team. And the same thing with workshops. You know, I think about that as an experience that we wanna bring people in and through or a design sprint and we're doing one next week. And we've been talking a lot about how we kind of move people through that experience and get them on board. Um, and so, so I guess, you know, there's moments where I like to just kind of pause for myself and say, how am I owning the X and that UX at different scales or in different, in different levels and, and use my lens as a user experience person, designer, researcher, um, as holistically as I can. Very good. Um, well, I'm going to ask a final question in just a couple of minutes, and that's basically going to be your final thoughts, what, uh, what you want to convey back to people about moving upstream the strategy. Um, before I do that, let me first of all thank both of you, Rebecca and Jennifer, for being panelists with us today. It was an honor to have you and to hear your point of view. I want to thank the UX Strat team as well, who helped put it together, uh, Elizabeth, Chelsea, and Ben. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to stay on the call. And if you have questions, uh, stick around and uh, we'll get to those questions or comments. Um, the advancing career focus is going to be a strong theme for us all this year, just because so many people are switching jobs. There are so many job openings uh, that this career um, path that we've been talking about in this panel and previous panels is going to be throughout all of our events this year, our conferences in Asia, US, and, and Europe. Um, so I hope we can also continue this conversation in the community in Slack. Um, our next meetup will be in May, uh, first Friday, and it's going to be moderated by Ben Judy. So let me get to my last uh, question before we take questions from other folks who are attending. I'm just going to open it back up to both of you. Uh, start with you, Rebecca, and just say any final thoughts for us. Yeah, I feel like I, get, I gave you guys my, you know, my big profound thought on the last one of like, what does UX mean and how do we embrace that X? So I'll, I'll zoom back in and just end with a couple of tactical things because I think we're also here to just take something away that we can apply. Um, and uh, a couple ones that we haven't touched on. Uh, this is like the least, you know, exciting tip I can give, but the more I found for myself, the more I can templatize process. Uh, the more I can then focus my energy and time on the deeper pieces. So, uh, you know, at Lyft, I didn't make this, but one of my favorite designers made little components. Um, they were in Sketch at the time, but they'll be in Figma now for journey mapping. And it was a game changer because then people could use these little people and cars and 
components to quickly create user journeys and then focus on the pain points and story they were trying to tell about that user journey. So a little tactical thing. Um, same thing with research decks. When you templatize that exec summary slide, you can then drop it into every deck and have it on hand and then spend your mental time and energy, which is precious, on the deeper, thornier things. Uh, and then the, the second one is more of a, a career piece that I feel like I've learned over time um, and I'm still learning, is advocating for the role you want to play and leaning into your strengths and feeling okay with that. We spend a lot of time performance reviews, feedback, thinking about what you need to develop and that's great. Um, but increasingly, uh, I think I like to take a, a point of view of where am I getting energy from? What can I lean into that's giving me energy? And then where can I advocate? If I'm on a project that I don't feel like I can add the most value to, I wanna, I wanna share how I think I could add more value. Long-term, it benefits my team, my organization and myself. And it took me a long time to feel comfortable directly advocating for where I wanna sit and play and the types of projects I wanna take on. Um, but I would encourage us all to just think about you, think about yourself as your own advocate in your career. Agreed. All right, Jennifer. Yeah, lots of great points in there. I wanna restate a point on empathy. Uh, we hear so much about empathy. And I think in this day and age of sometimes agile and rapid um, working styles and um, shortened timelines, uh, empathy sometimes gets lip service. And I have a more holistic view of empathy. You need to have empathy for your stakeholders. And then you also need to have empathy for your users. You can't have one without the other and be successful in UX. You need to understand where the trade-offs need to be made um, between those two points of view. And then the curiosity. Curiosity is really going to help you keep moving forward in environment if you're very passionate about the domain, but maybe the organization isn't at the maturity you want yet. That curiosity is going to give you the energy to try to bring changes from within and then also to try and have an impact within the power that you have in the organization. I think if you're not curious or excited about what you're working on, it's not going to, you're not gonna have that energy or that drive and maybe it might not worth, be worth it. Um, and to be honest, sometimes there might be organizations where um, you're not valued and then you have to really think very hard, is it worth it to keep pushing or is it better for me to find somewhere else to express my creativity and your um, impact on design on, on users? So we'll leave it with that. Outstanding. Well, thank you both um, for that. And I realize at some point you're both going to need to drop out, uh, but thank you so much for your time today. And um, I'm going to circle back with you about a recording of this session and see if we have permission to share it. Um, before I end, though, I want to give um, different people an opportunity to ask their questions or to make comments. Uh, ben, Judy, I wanted to ask you as senior UX strat statesman, uh, first of all, your thoughts, impressions, or any questions uh, for the panelists. Every time you say I'm a statesman, I feel like I should have some kind of accent or affectation. I don't know what that is, but I'm I like it. But OK. I only have about 19 questions because this was fantastic. Rebecca and Jennifer, I feel like we started to just take a first step in so many different directions that we could just go on and on. Um, but here's one that I'll throw at you that I think maybe hits on several different aspects of things we've talked about. I'd like to hear your opinion. Is, is there such a thing as a junior UX strategist? Is it feasible? Is it possible for someone to come into an organization, whether that's Google or or any, maybe a smaller company, any, any kind of company very early in their career with very little professional experience, um, whether as a UXer or anything else. Um, and, and think about all these things we've talked about, you know, to, to operate strategically, storytelling skills, 
really knowing what it means to empathize with business leaders um, and cross-functional partners, understanding business context. I'd love to hear from both of you. Can, can you be a junior UX strategist or do you kind of have to work your way up through the more tactical roles? I, as an interesting one, you know, I, I have come across people who I would say would call themselves UX strategists and were really junior. Um, they didn't necessarily have that specific title, but um, mixed feelings about that, uh, mostly because as you're thinking about strategy, a lot of it has to do with business it has to do with context, understanding things that only come with a level of exposure and time. Um, so I, I, I'm not going to put my hand down and say someone who's junior or new to UX can't do strategy, but I think there's so many nuances you pick up from having different experiences and varied experiences. Things go well, things not go so well in order to be able to recognize what to do in a specific situation. So I, I'm not gonna say no, but there would have to be a lot of context and training um, there. Yeah, I love that question. I feel like there's two parts to that. There's, do you wanna use that title if you're a junior person coming in? Uh, and my sort of gut response is maybe not. <laughs> you might be setting yourself up. Uh, you might not be setting yourself up for success. Um, and the other part of that is, can you take on or think about strategy as a more junior UXer? And I think a hundred percent, we need to just be thinking about different scales, right? So we may be talking about a feature that you're driving the strategy for or thinking about the strategy for, um, if you're coming in with less experience or in a more junior position. And then as you grow in your career and have more experience, more scope, the scale at which you can think about strategy expands. And we talk, I've heard, I have mixed feelings about this phrase, but we talk sometimes about product managers as mini CEOs. And there are very junior product managers and very senior product managers, which suggests that you can be a mini, mini, mini CEO, right? Of a very, of a much more contained scope and then grow it. Um, independent of whether that's the right analogy for a product manager, I think you can certainly think about that strategy lens for UX and just be intentional about the scope or scale at which you're defining or how you're operating. Great, I, thank you both. Um, there are others who have asked questions in the chat or have their hand up. I know Santos, you've, you've had your hand up in Zoom for a while. Do you wanna ask a question? Yeah, thanks, Judy. Thanks, uh, my name is Santosh, I'm from India. So I have uh, a question. Uh, a question in kind of question kind of as you said like I have a lot of micro question but I'm gonna ask only one question just for this time. Um, we also spoken about uh, empathizing with the cross-functional team and also on the other hand we also spoke when we doing a research presentation or a readout what we call um, to have it in a more contextual manner for every every cross-functional department so, tie with their uh, metrics as, as a takeaway. So that's that's really wonderful uh, to do that, even I am going through on that. So my question is, in that case, do we have to, as a researcher, do we have to learn some of their works and metrics or do we have to learn some of their skills to empathize more? Just for an example, I will give, as a data scientist, being in a call as a stakeholders to understand this as a project manager do i have to learn about the project management things and really kind of things otherwise i will not know exactly how to put across in a way which they can understand more uh, especially on uh, looking up and looking out of the project i have um, one response to that i i think about Understand your stakeholders and communications strategy and planning is a lot of work. And there's two ways to go about doing it. One is uh, as you're understanding the lay of the organization and the lay of the land within the organization, you know, who are the different stakeholders? What role do they play? 
what are they responsible for um, at the end of the year. Um, so you can do some desk research to figure that out if you have role assignments and expectations visible. Um, if you don't have that visible, I have a lot of one-on-ones with people, um, both inside and outside of the organization to understand what do you do? What do you care about? What keeps you up at night? That last question, what keeps you up at night, is the telltale one for me that helps me tailor specific communications to their needs, whether it's a functional need or individual communication need. Um, and when I mention it is a lot of work, I, I don't wanna underestimate that because it really means that you might have an overall generic presentation or story that you're telling to a broader group, but you do have to then take that and repurpose it for individual roles or individuals as well, and just highlight one or two or three points for them in order to find that place where you vibrate and harmonize with their thinking. So that's my thought there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. thank you. And do we have to learn uh, some of the skills like some of the early uh, things, for an example, data science, do we have to learn a few of the um, uh, things to understand more and then focus more on uh, data-driven uh, decisions in uh, larger organizations where we handle big level of data? And I think I would build on what Jennifer said and, and um... I don't think there's one right answer to that question. It's going to depend on the team product you're working in and also what you're interested in. Yes, I think that empathy with your cross-functional partners is key and understanding where they're coming from is, I would say, table stakes. But if you, I think it's up to you on whether you want to start learning some of those skills as well. Uh, I think you'll drive yourself crazy if you're trying to become, <laughs> while being a UXer, trying to also gain the skills of a data scientist, an engineer, a product manager. Um, you know, that's a 24 hour plus a day job. Uh, there's a reason it's divided across people. But, you know, I've certainly done sessions when I feel an interest in something with a data scientist that can we sit down for half an hour and you just like walk me through your dashboards, how you think about it. Um, and I've taken a SQL class, you know, I've done things when I wanted to dip into something for my own interest, but I wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, put pressure on yourself to take on the skills of all these other roles as well. I'm going to jump in here real quick, just to acknowledge that it's uh, the, the top of the hour. So our hour is up. Paul, do you want to say anything? I can hang on and keep talking. I don't know if Rebecca, Jennifer, what your schedule's like, but Paul, do you want to do anything to, to just sort of wrap up the hour? Oh, you're muted, Paul. Um, the air conditioner is so loud. Uh, Jennifer and Rebecca, I wanted to thank you again. I realize you have time commitments and you've jumped on for this. I really appreciate that very much. I'm going to stick around. Uh, Ben's going to stick around. Uh, but again, thank you both very much for your time and expertise and really appreciate you participating. Um, and I will again uh, stick around for a while, see what other discussion points that we have. So thank you. Thank you. Thanks for your great questions, everyone. Thank you. This is great. So nice to virtually meet everyone. Jennifer, I'm excited to find you inside uh, <laughs> the mothership and actually say hi after this. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Thank you. I do have to drop another meeting, but it was really nice to, to see everyone's tiny heads in different forms. So.